I'm Gerardo Sepanen. I'm leading machine learning at Supercell, uh, this mobile games company. And the topic of the talk today is how we build a game AI in the game Clash Royale. So briefly about Clash Royale. So it's a mobile game. Uh, you see a video uh, going from the game here where two players meet uh, in real time in mobile devices and wage epic three minute battles. Uh, the game is mob, uh, in mobile, obviously, and it's free to play, and it launched six years ago, uh, 2016. And here you can see uh, the video is taken actually from uh, the bots playing the game. So uh, this is what happens. So in the gameplay, you have two players, the blue and red, and they place these units on the board. And then after placement, the units uh, behave based on their in-game mechanics. Uh, so go forward, yeah. So then about game AI, uh, first of all, what does that mean? It's kind of like a fancy fancy term, but in, in simplicity, it means just means computer controlled characters in games. And there's uh, arguably in all games ever built, there's some level of game AI uh, that can be used for like uh, uh, game content, like practice opponents or boss levels, or then teaching the players how to play tutoring, or even testing the game during development. Uh, there's a lot of different uses for game AI. And what we'll be talking about today is bots or like uh, computer controlled opponents in the game. And then how game AI is traditionally made is uh, similar to what Antti described, like these kind of rule-based systems. So, uh, there's some game code that looks at the game state and there's hand curated uh, like logic decisions. What should the AI do when something happens in game? That's how it traditionally is done. But what we're going to talk about is uh, machine learning or imitation learning from game replays. So uh, yeah, we're going to use actual data from the game, uh, actual battles from real players and train a model to imitate how players play. Oops. And then, but the, quickly, some background about uh, why this is useful and what, uh, what the objective is of the work. Uh, so, first of all, uh, Clash Royale as a game has this purpose of uh, delivering casual and fun game experiences to uh, player, its players. So, we want the game to be really approachable and like uh fun and like casual to everybody like really low uh barrier to trying it out and not especially focused for like hardcore gamers or such but at the same time the game design is uh, player versus player so there's two players who meet in the game and there's this kind of natural tension between these two uh angles so we want to be have a casual game that is player versus player, which is kind of like an oxymoron in itself. Uh, uh, is it even possible to do? Uh, and the reason why it's uh, player versus player is difficult because whenever two players meet, one of them uh, loses. So there's like uh, one player wins, one the other player loses. So there's always a loser in every match. And like, while that might seem obvious, like that's what happens in like chess or whatever games, it actually pre feels pretty like brutal if like every half on average, every, every second match is a loss or like a beating. So that's like a, why it can feel quite non-casual, the player versus player games. Uh, in concrete terms, looking at like the in-game activity log, like if you have this player versus player game and you lose every second match on average, here yeah, what it looks like. So you have some victories, some defeats, but somehow like the, like the defeats uh, feel much worse. They're like in much bolder color here because they kind of like overshadow the victories. Like when you remember about what happened. And this is like the, the motivation for trying the bot. So we want to, wanted to try out like what would happen if we were able to change this, like let's say into 70% win rate or something like bigger than 50%. So let's say if there's only like, uh, if you remember your 10 last matches and there's like, only three of them were losses and not half of them. We feel that that would make the game, game more casual and like 
uh, try to solve this dilemma of uh, casual PVP. And yeah, this 70% is just like an arbitrary number. We just want, wanted to try out uh, adding bots so that uh, the human, the real players win rate would be higher and the bots would be the ones who would uh, like have to face these uh, most of the defeats in the game. So that's like the, the motivation or the overall setting, what, why, the, why the bots are interesting to us and what we wanted to test out with them. Uh, then let's switch gears a bit into the actual uh, implementation or what does the game look like and what does the bot, bot look like. So here I see the observation and action spaces in the game. On the left, the observation space, on the right, the action space. So as I mentioned, there's two players, uh, blue and red, and uh, the action space is like a grid. It's a discrete grid that's also visible in the game as this like tile pattern. Uh, the observation area is 32 by 18 tiles. Uh, and from the right, you can see that from already from the start, you cannot place troops everywhere. For example, you cannot place troops on top of the river in the middle, or you cannot place troops on top of the, the towers, either your own or the opponents. So it's like not like a regular grid, but it's like grid with some uh, constraints. And then there's always the weight action additionally available. So you can always just decide to wait and not deploy anything. This is like the uh, the like the background or the like the foundation of the observation and action spaces. But then if we look at the actual like more realistic uh, scenario from the game, it gets much more dynamic and much more uh, like uh, fast changing. So we have actual troops on the left uh, that have been placed on the on the board. There can be hundreds, more than 100 different types of troops. For example, here we have the balloon or the musketeer. And then in, the, in addition, you can have like um, up to 100 or so like instances of any individual troop at the same time. For example, here we have two, two barbarians at the same time. And the tro other troops are moving in real time as the game progresses. So it's very uh, time sensitive. It doesn't like change. It doesn't stay the same way for long. And then also like the, depending on what, how the game has progressed, you can see that the tower has been destroyed here. So it's actually now possible to deploy on top of that uh, location. So the action space is also quite dynamic. Uh, changes based on what has happened in the game and which actions are legal and which are not uh, changes during the game. So what the objective is for the bot to be able to place, for example, this musketeer here, uh, if the bot is playing the blue player here, it, the, the action <clears throat> could be to place the musketeer here on this grid point um, to maybe combat what's above in this case. Uh, and the challenge is to do a neural network that does this. Uh, so we have the input on the left and the, and the output on the right, the observation space on the left or the action space on the right. Uh, in practice, like the the theoretical action space size is more than 50,000 uh, individual actions, even though it's discrete, which is nice for machine learning, but it's quite large cardinality. So 50,000 different kinds of actions are possible, but in practice, because of the dynamism and all the constraints, it's limited to between one and 2,000 actions uh, at any given time. So then what we... Um, yeah, well, when you started to think about what, what to do, how do we do a model that can play the game? Uh, well, first thing you do with machine learning is to an MNIST tutorial, and that's what we also did. And I like the MNIST is this digit recognition uh, benchmark task. So you have these digits on the left, and you have 10 numbers. That, uh, the task is to uh, detect which digit is, has been uh, written on the paper. And this actually, like, it's surprisingly close to that problem, the, the class royale problem, because we have a discrete input. It's quite low resolution, 20, 32 by 18. Uh, and then we have a discrete output, although it might be 2,000 or 50,000, but it's still discrete. Just pick one out of the possible uh, uh, actions. So it's actually was quite like a promising thought that maybe this is, this is already feasible uh, uh, because MNIST works, maybe this works as well. And also this was um, to highlight this also uh, is a conscious design choice to try to make the system 
as simple as possible. So we didn't want to take uh, put any memory into the system, for example. It's completely memoryless. It just looks at one snapshot of a frame and decides the action in that frame, uh, including weight. And then it forgets everything that it has seen in the next frame. But even though we simplified the, uh, the network, we didn't simplify any of the gameplay. So the game is actually uh, the real game. Uh, the full, full uh, uh, set of all the units, the uh, actual gameplay mechanics, everything is like, everything there is not simplified, but it's the real deal. Uh, so this is what the network looks like. It looks like it gets the observation on the left uh, in some discretized or like maybe a bit more tensoric form. And then there's the network, a classifier network, a ResNet network, and it just uh, classifies the frame into one of the actions where the action number zero is waiting, which means not to deploying anything. And then the action start, like the action number one could be deploy this musketeer into the bottom left tile. And then the next tile and the next tile and so on. And then in this case, we might have like 2,300 uh, possible actions in this frame. That's what the network looks like. Uh, all the inputs and outputs look like. Then what the net network itself looks like is that it's, a, as I mentioned, it's a pretty standard ResNet or residual net neural network where we have uh, a bunch of these residual blocks uh, just piled on top of each other. Uh, there's uh, some of well, this the topmost uh, path is the standard ResNet path. Then there's some, because this is like the, the board is like a 32 by 18 image. Although with more like natural images have three channels for red, green and blue, but we have like tens and tens of channels because we have these tens and tens of different kinds of units that can occupy each of those tiles. Uh, but then we also have some like this, like a spatial uh, part of the input. Then we have some non-spatial non stuff or like contextual stuff. For example, which what's, what are the cards that you are like allowed to play in this battle? Uh, which card, which of them are like active at any given time? Some kind of contextual stuff, which we then just like uh, transform into similar uh, dimension as the like the spatial stuff and then just add in the middle of the rest. Of it. So uh, it's as if all this contextual information would be like omnipresent everywhere in all, all of the tiles, uh, like intuitively. Uh, 21 convolutional layers. Uh, yeah, this is a bit smaller than usual rest nets that can go up to 150 layers, but of course the input is also much uh, more like pre-digested, there's no, it's like, it's kind of like half an image and half like symbolic form already, because there are no like, for example, things like edge detection that natural image uh, processing networks have to be able to do. It's kind of like all pre-digested because it's coming directly from the game engine. We know exactly which troop is in, exactly in which position in the, in the game. That's like a, by like a, shallower network also uh, suff suffices here. And then, yeah, it's pretty standard classif classification like uh, architecture and it outcomes an action in 2300 dimensions. Then some results that we got, uh, first of all, it's uh, due to the problem setting, it can be quite difficult to evaluate, like does this thing play like the real players do that we, um, are training it to do. So we're trying, training the, the bot to imitate real players actions from real players uh, battle replays. But then it's hard to say like, that's actually how, how successful are we in that? And one thing that, that, that we looked at was um, just the classification accuracy. So out of these actions that the network is uh, generating each frame, how many percent of them were the exact same action that the players did in the real battles. That's just of the order of 4%. It's very, very, very small because it's also like, and it's also not very uh, indicative because if you switch certain, if you shift certain actions by one tile, it might make no difference in the gameplay. So like it's, it's not 
necessary to do the exact same actions by and the exact same tile position as the real players. It's like more like a proxy metric that is just like we're using as like a smoke test that is learning anything at all. But then the actual thing is just to do empirical play testing, uh, put the bot into the game and play against it ourselves. And that's like how we actually tested if this thing works or not. And yeah, it felt, felt okay. Like the bot was doing something sensible, something non-sensible, but like it felt that yeah, it, it's useful as an opponent to be able to learn about the game. And it, like the objective, as I mentioned, is the objective was not to uh, train like a superhuman optimal uh, bot. It's not like this kind of alpha zero type of thing that we try to do, but more, rather like imitate average players, including average mistakes that the players make. And that's like what we verified with game testing that, yeah, it felt like that. Then we deployed the model in game and it brought an A-B test with some uh, actual tests that that's how we can actually test if it, if it does anything sensible, uh, how are the metrics looking like? And for example, we uh, measured the net win, win rate for human players and we just coincidentally ended up about at about 72%. So we were able to lift all the like real players win rates uh, up to like from starting from 50% to like 70%, which was kind of like the, the point of the whole experiment. Uh, then about the live system, uh, we trained this on 70 million frames of real game replays. Uh, yeah, this has been in production in game uh, for four years now already. Uh, and this, since this is like a, the point of the feature is to try to like um, make the game feel more casual, maybe also let the players like learn how to play the game. So it's only live for low or mid trophy players, like, um, like early and mid game players. But then because this is like a, it's also like boosting the game, the player progress, and it's kind of like an unfair advantage, uh, you can argue. So then when the like the, the real the real game of skill like happens in the like the, for the late game players, the players who have like uh, unlocked everything in the game and they know how the game works, then for those players we don't want to uh, uh, offer these bots because then they, they might be like even uh, offended that we are like underestimating their skill or whatever. So they, but of the end game players, the game becomes like a game of skill and the bots are not present there. Then something about uh, the serving perspective. So we decided that the network is uh, memoryless in the beginning, just out of simplicity, but it happened to be very beneficial during like production because the production system is also stateless. Uh, it's just like a pure function. You, the game, sends a frame of like the, the frame of state from the game like game engine how does the gameplay look like at any given point in time and then the bot replies with an action and it's like very nice in software terms like how to integrate into the game and yeah in terms of integration so we implemented the, the bot obviously in pytorch but then we for production use we exported this into this JIT system and like to be able to run it in C++, so there's no Python in the production system running anymore. And yeah, it's been life of four years and we have already served more than one trillion frames with the bot, or the bot has played more than one trillion frames. So yeah, it's like working as, it, as expected. But that was my talk, thank you. <laughs>